machines are biased, any AI is biased, every algorithm is biased. There are, there are no unbiased algorithms, but there are no unbiased humans either. I've studied them. I have yet to encounter a single <laughs> one. And we need algorithms and data to prove the bias of humans as much as we need humans to prove the bias of AI. All right, so hello everyone and welcome to the AI Stories podcast. I'm Neil Lizer, I'm a data scientist at IWOCA and I will be your host. So today our guest is Marain Marcus. Marain first studied a bachelor and a master in sociology at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. And after that, he worked on a few projects. He worked on modeling the spread of Ebola, and he also worked with the policy in the Netherlands on crime prediction. In 2016, he actually joined Capgemini as a data scientist, and we're now in 2023, and he's still working there, managing a team of data scientists. We're going to talk about some of the projects that he worked on there. And we're also going to talk about data in a consulting firm, which is quite different than in a normal um, company. So yeah, if you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe to the AI Stories YouTube channel and leave a five-star review, comment, share, do whatever you can to help the podcast. All right, let's start now. Hi, Marain. How is it going? How are you today? Hey, my man. Thanks for having me, first of all. Yeah, my pleasure. Hope everything is going well. Yeah, doing good. I got coffee and you got questions, so let's do this thing. Yeah, let's start. It's been a while. We wanted to plan this for a while. So yeah, looking forward to this conversation. And let's begin with the beginning. You... Well, you worked on modeling the spread of Ebola and this, from what you told me, this is kind of where you realize that data can have a big impact on our world. So do you want to talk about this experience and how you kind of started to get into the world of AI? Well, if I didn't want to talk about it, I wouldn't be on your podcast. <laughs> so for the listeners there, um, way back in the day, Before we started calling everything AI and data science, I was, uh, I was a social science student, that is correct. And I did a master's in policy analysis and big data because back then big data was a cool word that everyone caught on to, buzzword. Um, and my, my dad wondered what the heck Marijn was going to do for a living because he does, just does data and something with human behavior and statistics. That, that ain't sexy at all. Who, who does that? You know, who does that? Um, and way before, like years before that, I was very much involved in WikiLeaks, if you, if you remember that, 2007 and 8, and uh, using open data and using leaked data to determine what's, what's happening and speak truth to power and that kind of stuff. And it was during my internship in 2014, so that's nine years ago now, and I don't want to think too hard about that that I was doing an internship at Gyro555, which is a large Dutch NGO that helps uh, helps developing nations in times of uh, need, like like dur during typhoons, during, um, during natural disasters. They're now raising funds uh, for, the, for the Turkey earthquake, for, exa uh, for example, and the, the, which affected Syria as well, even more, more so actually, because we can't, get aid into Syria as easily as we can get it into Turkey. Those same people are still working there and they're doing God's work. It's amazing. And I was there as an intern all those years ago, just doing stupid data modeling stuff on how much cash was spent on which part of the, uh, on which island of the Philippines after the Haiyan flood. Then Ebola happened. Suddenly the world's, Then biggest pandemic, if you can remember it, hitting West Africa, Sierra Leone, etc. And suddenly the, the stupid data stuff that I was learning during my courses, like city geography, so the spatial distribution of effects and how that moves across areas, how to visualize that, how to put that in maps. And I was using that to get 
to, to, to model open data of infection numbers. And I was building maps based on that. And those maps were being used on the Dutch national news to show people how terrible the situation uh, was in West Africa. And we used that to raise millions of uh, euros in funds to send emergency aid over there. And that's the point in my life that I realized that the shit I do with data can actually help people. So obviously I took a picture of that television displaying my stuff and I sent it to my mom saying, go show dad, my stuff is worth something. Love you, mom, dad. Um, so that, that's when I learned that you can actually use this stuff. And it's actually a value, something I was not told during the majority of my study, or at least not shown in that way. And that feeling that I had back then is something I want every damn student out there to have. The moment that you realize that the stuff you do can help people. So to me, that is the most beautiful thing there is. And that's, that's all I want to do in life. And so two questions based on this project. Um, mm -hmm. The first one is, was the goal actually to raise awareness and then raise money? Was there another goal, like better understanding how Ebola was spreading in Africa and how to better, for example, cure the disease or whatever? Um, both in this case, but primarily the first one, we were mainly raising funds to show how terrible it was. Um, but... This is a tough one when it comes to natural disasters. The moment, uh, any data you have at the moment itself is already late, already outdated, because you, you only get infection numbers of X days past. So it's actually a whole lot worse than mm -hmm. that already. So you have to portray the future situation to your audience to show how bad it truly is. It's like... I, I, death, toll, death tolls are not a, a very fun topic, but they are a very relevant topic in, in like, uh, usually it's uh, a, uh, many folds the number that, that you, that gets reported on the first few days. So forecasts are actually a part of the information you have to grant here. And that, that's where that part came from. So looking at the impact, did you manage in the end to raise money how much money did you manage to uh, raise you might google it but it was 10.6 million euros back then which was a lot considering oh. people didn't care as much about pandemics back then and that is a terrible thing to say by now but at that point in time so not, not eight nine years ago that was reality and yeah it hurts me a lot to say this as a sociologist uh But a lot of people in the West just don't care enough for, for countries in Africa, for people in Africa. Hell, they, they call it Africa and that's it, which is a gross generalization by itself. But which, I was working with people from there. so. Which graph do you think then raised awareness? If you had to describe one graph, one visualization. Oh, God, it's, it's on Google. My, my shit's on Google. <laughs> Like uh, you, just a map of Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, and and showing the numbers of uh, of uh, of infections in absolute numbers and in relative uh, numbers. I'll uh, I'll send you the link in a bit. And so at this and point, we were updating that every day, and you saw it progress worse right. day by day. Mm -hmm. And that to me, that was the big impact. That's how you visualize it. Just show two maps, and then. Here it's slight, and here suddenly, oh God. And so at, at this point, do you actually realize that you can actually have quite a big impact by using data? That was the very first, uh, no, that, the very first thing I as an individual realized, because I did it years before in, in collective situations, like like in the, in the WikiLeaks days when everyone was anonymous back in the day. Uh, but for me as an individual, that was the big, I am a part of a bigger team, so much bigger team. There's marketeers, there's people on the ground, people in communication, and you're all collaborating. You all know different things, and that's actually why you can collaborate. So it's the total opposite of the academics, where I only ever felt stupid because I was working with a professor who always knew more about it than me. Suddenly, I had to be the expert, which more on that later as a consultant. But that was a big game changer 
for me. But only when you're the expert, which is a very scary thing because there's nobody to trash your, your statistical methods anymore. Um, but that's when you realize how much value you are bringing to a group of people. And that is a very cool thing. That is nice. No, that is very cool. That's already during one of your first projects, you managed to raise awareness for something that's quite important and managed to raise like 10 millions. So, yeah. Note this was a project of like, okay, the pandemic was way bigger, but the action and the gathering was like one, two months tops. So we did not have a luxury mm -hmm. of tuning a model for half a year. Those, those mm -hmm. are different kinds of projects, different, different situations. You had to act quickly. Exactly. So moving on then from Ebola, you then actually worked on crime prediction at some point for the police in Netherlands. Uh, crime analysis. I wouldn't say it prediction at the micro level because you just can't do that it, it, there there's movies with tom cruise about that they always start talking to me about that but you, but you can't do that at the individual level but you can do it at the macro level at the aggregated level and nowadays we call all of this oh that's ai algorithms in my day it was yeah it, this is i'm doing a master's thesis in big data and criminology together let's do this mm -hmm. Because um, what I researched, and I'm thankful that you keep asking this, because I didn't, I did this as part of my paper, so I can actually talk about this. Um, we were looking at neighborhood level factors that influence crime and different types of crime. Um, ever been to Rotterdam, my hometown? No, never been. Okay, it's the biggest harbor in Europe, disregarding uh, Istanbul. Um, so it has the biggest drug traffic of Europe as a side consequence of just have, having the biggest harbor and the biggest traffic. Mm -hmm. So 80% of all cocaine in Europe passes through our harbors, a lot of cocaine, um, and a lot of drug crime, a lot of violent crime, uh, um, which really affects neighborhoods and people too. Um, and I had data, multiple years of data at that point in time, and started researching different crime rates for different uh, parts of the city and how those were affected by neighborhood level factors. So not just the amount of criminals in the neighborhoods, which is like a standard thing if people immediately think of, but, um, and, or, or standard stuff like, um, how do I say this in a correct way? Um, in my country, the, there's a big discourse on that ethnic minorities cause crime. So you grab mm -hmm. data on concentration of ethnic minorities. Well. That is a big predictor of crime until you control for other factors like poverty, because there's a huge correlation mm -hmm. with poverty. So I grabbed the uh, low income rates, joblessness rates, et cetera. And then I'm just doing, it was regression modeling back then mm -hmm. to cancel out the effects to see which one is stronger, which one disappears. Well, ethnic minority effects disappear the moment you control for, uh, for poverty. And then I started adding neighborhood level factors like trust between citizens and that was the big factor so it was looking at different policies enacted in that area as well as uh, according to neighborhood level census census data uh, how often do we do we talk to your neighbors do you trust them do they watch the, the kids outside and such and i was just digging through a whole lot of census data that's collected every year by dutch governments mm -hmm. and found hey um, if you combine these questions from different censuses, you have eight out of nine metrics that Sampson, Robert J. Sampson, one of the biggest criminologists in the world from the Chicago school, um, used to model crime in his city. So I was using secondhand data left and right to do the, to implement the same in Rotterdam to look at um, what are the biggest predictors and biggest preventers thus mm -hmm. of neighborhood levels of crimes. And uh, which gives you an indication of what policy you should enact to reduce it or increase it, depending on what, what you want to do. Um, and a, a big outcome of that was, for example, that trust between citizens was one of the biggest um, uh, predictors of lack of crime, meaning neighborhood level trust, especially when viewed over uh, year over year. Um, increasing the communication and trust between citizens is one of the biggest preventative things you can do to keep your city safe. First, because uh, because um, 
Uh, firstly, because it just di directly affects um, um, because it direct oh, man, it's been a while because it directly affects how many people uh, fight crime. Like, pick up the phone if you see stuff happening. That needs to be the norm. If that isn't the norm, people don't trust each other and don't trust in the government. Nothing's gonna happen. But also preventative, like um, this, uh, this behavior is not tolerated over here. This is not the norm over here. We will actively address, hey, Mickey, stop trashing the, uh, trashing the, the, the trash cans, for example. And um, it's these smaller actions at large that inhibit a lot of different forms of crime. Now, there, there are uh, interaction effects here that, that, that skew the distribution. Like, for example, if there is high-level criminals in the neighborhood that also have a strong social network, so are in, into the trust, mm -hmm. then you get an adverse effect or a negative interaction effect, like that they, they cancel each other out to a certain extent. To, to, to quote an interview, I didn't report the young man to the police because his mom is such a sweet lady, which is at the very core of the issue here in that social networks, strong social networks, mm -hmm also include those criminal elements in the neighborhood. So um, st simply strengthening those ties can also have an adverse effect uh, in Rotterdam, mm -hmm. as well as you know, major cities, but we have a lot, it's a big city, so we have a lot of data, let's go. Um, if you do not account for keeping those criminal elements outside of those networks, and this is why the same policy enacted in different neighborhoods, I can't mention names, mm -hmm. can have wildly different consequences. And which is why blanket solutions like, oh, yeah, we need to fight crime more uh, across the entire town or do more census data across the entire town can have wildly different effects per, per, per area. area. And then we have beauties like, oh, yeah. It's switching from this area to this area, and then it disappeared. And I'm like, no, it, it switched into mm. the neighborhood town next town over. And then I had the, I'll never forget that. Marijn, a waterbed effect is also an effect, and we can report this. It's very interesting. So you, was the idea to train a model that predicts crime and kind of analyze the coefficients to understand yeah, which yeah, ones were... Prediction its analysis because the big thing here let's be honest 90 percent of all ai in production is regression <laughs> mm -hmm. um the, the regression models and random forest models were not built not developed 30 40 years ago for prediction they were developed for causal analysis mm -hmm. after which we turn the model um it, reverse it uh, to say what's gonna happen mm -hmm. but they were first foremost meant to explain what has already happened um, and there we have the crucial weird step in me for me as a consultant in that all the all the companies want you to predict the future mm. but they don't want you to, to analyze the data of the past but only if you understand the causal effects at play over mm. there can you ever make any indication about what's mm -hmm. going to happen and what 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 should be happening I, I I usually this is the most fun part for me as a social scientist. I get very weird faces when I go like hamburger prices, when modeling flows of refugees, which is a project way later in in my timeline, because we used hamburger prices as financial in, as uh, financial indicators of economic growth in countries, mm -hmm. which is better than the actual financial reports published by those countries. And only when you understand those causal mechanisms of the past can you say anything mm -hmm. worth any damn about the future. But usually when you analyze the past, you also find mm -hmm. out where the CXO or whatever messed up, where the organization yeah. really um, uh, went down a cliff or whatever. And for some odd reason, they don't want you to look at that. So tra That's training... The training your model on data from the past and then analyzing the coefficients of your model to drive insights, like which variable are... Exactly. If if you don't know why you're going to sell more beer tomorrow, then what the heck are you going <laughs> to do about it? I want it, I want data on, uh, on, the, on what the weather was like, on how much beer you actually sold, when there were marketing um, um, actions, and when football was on TV. Because marketing will sure as heck tell everyone, 
yes, it was due to our great campaign, blah, blah, that we sold so much beer. Well, give me the data. I'm going to see if it had an effect or not. Usually it's actually football and nice weather that, that are mm-hmm. the big forecasters. But only if I proved that football and sunny mm-hmm. weather matters, then I can recommend you should put beer in the bonus when it's nice and when Feyenoord is playing. We need, it's a prerequisite that everyone skips. One tricky bit here is the classic correlation isn't causation. Like you could, oh, definitely. Uh, how do you account for that? Like you could have some correlation between one variable and crime, um, which well, I might already not... mentioned uh, uh, one just now. Ethnic minorities uh, cor- mm-hmm. correlate, but it's not causation because they strongly correlate with um, various metrics of um, uh, of unemployment, low income, at least in Rotterdam still to this day. It's something we're still working on. Um, and there is no statistical trick of the AI itself that mm-hmm. can fix those causal, uh, those causal back and forth. There you need humans in, in the loop, scientists in the loop to tell, well, this ga- data was gathered first and this data was gathered later. So it can't go like that. Mm-hmm. And I, I nowadays, as a, as a, I, I manage a lot of data science teams and I, I work with, uh, theoretical uh, mathematicians, uh, physicists, econom- econometricians, computer scientists, psychologists, like the, the whole taste the rainbow. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, com- it's simple science methods, like the whole CRISP DM, the, the scientific method of figuring out, reading the papers, these are the causal mechanisms that should be at play. Let's gather data for that. Let's test that. Let's see if we can get a model with that. And only then we have an outcome. The science parts of data science, because data science is applying scientific models to solve data problems. That is the easiest way I can explain to my mom what the heck I do mm-hmm. uh, for work. Has a big science component. Yeah. And if you just auto ML the hell out of your problem, sure, you can go to Azure or AWS or Google's, it's all cool, and throw your data in and they'll optimize a model way hot, more hardcore than I ever could. But it's not nearly as usable. Keep everything as simple as possible, but no more simple than that. Like a lot of, a lot of students, I, I guide a, a lot of students through stuff, get the question, okay, what type of model should I build? And I go like, no, you you figure out what model you're build you're building. I'm just giving you the problem because it's your job to assess if you're doing a random forest or a neural net or going deep in on on deep learning neural nets. Mm-hmm. And then you it, you figure out is it worth the ec- extra accuracy to sacrifice transparency and explainability because those are usually used mutually exclusive. But when I'm judging, I don't know something involving people's lives. There's no way in hell I'm going to use a deep learning model for that because then they mm-hmm. sue it and can't explain why. Or it takes me too much time mm-hmm. to explain why. No, that's, that's a very good point. That's actually very interesting. I just actually finished the book of why, which talks a lot about causation. And your example, for example, of ethnical minorities, when if you just look at correlation between crime and ethnical minorities you would think There's oh no actually way data itself will tell you yeah. that and this is in a crazy way to my surprise that a social scientist can actually help people here we were mm-hmm. calculating gender pay gaps at some uh, point for a project and the computer scientist was going like how do you do that and li- and i'm like oh i did a paper on that in my mm-hmm. second year because I learned to complain about ethics and bias. And suddenly, the hill, all of LinkedIn is screaming about ethics and bias. It's just now they call it AI nowadays. Yeah, so your example, your, your example of controlling for poverty. So I, as soon as you control for poverty, you don't actually see this ethnical minority it effect. Not, I think it was no longer statistically yeah. uh, uh, relevant. But again, that is why we developed these methods to test and research these things only after comes the forecasting Mm -hmm. and even if you haven't if you haven't even gotten to the forecasting you can already have a great impact Mm -hmm. on on the organization you're doing it for because you're usually encountering 
all kinds of bad decision making in the past or encountering all kinds of huge, terrible data quality stuff on fire and helping fix that alone uh, can already be a huge boon to the company because mm-hmm. you know, the risk of getting sued for millions decreases slightly. I think this is one example of why AI isn't really close to taking our jobs. Because if you want to drive those kind of insights on causation, for example, you actually need a human. Data alone, as you mentioned, cannot Hello. figure that out for you. You need a brain, you need a human to build a model of the world. What comes after what? What comes before what? What causes what? Without any irony, you need a diverse group of humans. Because you had the, the eternal joke of stuff 10 computer scientists in a, in, a, in a box, add data, and wait for magic to happen. <laughs> That's how most organizations started out their data science journey. Well, the magic didn't happen because you'd need more than just computer scientists, as cool as they are. Um, or one client whose name I shan't mention uh, came to me like, Marijn, you're a consultant, so you hire you to, to fix data pro- uh, data science problems for you. I don't need you. I already have 10 people. And I remember the coffee was really bad that day. I was in a grumpy mood. So I just asked him, what did they study? And he's like, yeah, they're all econometricians. And I'm like, now I have you. So what can they do with image recognition? Yeah, well, no, what about audio recognition? Yeah, well, what about NLP? Yeah, well, mm-hmm. but they can optimize the hell out of a linear regression model. Note this was five years ago. By now, econometrician educations are probably shifted, but it was heavily focused on very very good, very important, explainable statistical models back then. It was less machine learning than now. But if you only hire people who can only do one thing, then you're only going to be able to do one thing. The coolest part for me as a managing data scientist is that I work with people who studied everything I haven't, including astronomy or astrology is one of the two he gets angry when mm-hmm. i mess that up i'm sorry um cuz they know stuff that i don't so if i work with them i'm learning stuff i'm learning new stuff and that is the major thing you need to keep doing in the entirety of your career doing and learning new stuff so having a diverse team is super important if you want to well deploy successful projects in the same way, like our field is finally maturing, man. People, um, data engineer is the new data scientist until prompt engineer catches on, at least. Though I already saw the first, uh, uh, the, I already saw the first post uh, prompt engineer uh, required mm-hmm. five years of experience. Because <laughs> the field is finally maturing and we're figuring out we, there are different names for different tasks. You have to data engineer, you have to data scientist, you have to, uh, you have to the, the BI, the visualist, you have analytics translator, which is usually the, the age old person f- for business who talks to IT, nothing new, but usually they mess up because they don't actually understand IT. They just think, yeah, I can talk real good so I can tell them what happens. And the joke is or those organizations all get stuck because... Um, Organization, modern organizations have IT departments when they should be striving to become IT organizations because the only organization who doesn't become, the only ones who don't become or, IT organizations in the future are the ones who are dinosaurs who are already dead. The head mm-hmm. just doesn't know. It's, uh, it's become IT centric or die. And we saw this before. We saw this four or five times before when, the, when, uh, when typewriters were adopted, when computers themselves were adopted, when... Uh, when uh, when radio was adopted, when phones were adopted, and everyone who said, no, my work adds too much value, or I don't need how to use that weird mouse and keyboard thing. In the end, they did need to because it just because it just accelerated their work or they lost their jobs. And chat GPT nowadays, which is horrible to me because it's about generative AI and large language models. Chat G- only saying chat GPT is like only talking iPhones when you really wa- when you really want to talk about smartphones. Um, and it just shows you're an amateur to anyone who knows their stuff. Um, is just the latest because now we're automating part of writing in the same way that a typewriter and autocorrect enhanced and 
sped up our work. It didn't ruin all the jobs. Neither can Chat GPT because it's making too much mistakes. Um, and the and and it's always the answer is way too generic. But if you just need to write six pages for a paper and hand something in, it's great. <laughs> Which means now the teachers can no longer give you a passing grade just because you wrote six pages because you can <laughs> use an AI to do that. Now they'll actually have to read your paper and grade you on the content, on the quality, not the quantity. So I'm actually very enthusiastic how this will change our modern education system for the better. Yeah, it's going to be more work for teachers and maybe a bit more thinking for students. Um, they're going to need to... always the game. It changes. It doesn't disappear. Ten years ago, I was doing data and statistics. I was not hype at all. Now it's the pinnacle of hype. I'm still doing the same damn thing. Um, it's just slightly more mature. And God knows, man, in 10 years, years time, you'll be yeah. uh, doing a podcast on quantum mm -hmm. AI or something. We'll still be using regression models. <laughs> What are you talking about? In in 10 years, ChatGPT will do the podcast for me. <laughs> I look forward to that day. Let's do another podcast then. We'll have our models talk to each yeah. other. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. My ChatGPT interviewing your ChatGPT. Uh, that is the way where this is heading. The market is now just blown up with, oh, a generic model. No, now companies... Just like companies buy Microsoft Office licenses in next year's time, they'll be buying access to proprietary models that write answers in their marketing style or something. Yeah, who knows what's going to happen in 10 years. Then things can change quite, quite a lot. I mean, AI has progressed quite a lot over the past five to 10 years already. So it's just going to increase so exponentially. Years, no, it, wasn't happening. it was 2013 that... Mm -hmm. Uh, and NVIDIA used the first Atlas GPU to uh, to run a neural net. The, the AI craze started in 2013 and only caught on in 14, 15, 16, back when we were still mm -hmm. making big data, big data memes. And we're actually still bottlenecking like heck because we're focusing on deep learning models and that's it. Let's continue to talk about AI, but more on your career. Let's move to the consulting parts ah. in... I know you You seem keen to talk about this. In 2016, you actually joined Capgemini as a data scientist. You're still there now, so I guess you're enjoying quite a lot. You've been there for, what, six, seven years? Um, so, yeah, six, do you... Six, seven, six years? That's right. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, do, well, do you want to talk a bit about Capgemini, what you've done there? Maybe talk about one impactful project. Yeah, I have two actually, but let me start out here by saying, especially to all the students listening, that I screwed up my intake story conversation. Like I was way too nervous, didn't know what I was going to talk about. Uh, and then um, the guy asked me, so what did you do for your thesis? And then suddenly 15 minutes later, I was done talking about how we use census data to explain why people are getting stabbed in which part of Rotterdam. And then he said, wow, that's cool, that's data science, <laughs> which was a relatively new word for me at the time. And I said, yes, because I needed a job. Well, six years later, I'm now managing consultant uh, at, uh, at Capgemini because uh, I actually quite enjoyed working there. I quite enjoy the, the consulting uh, world as a whole because if, uh, if you're, especially if you're new to the field, and you don't know what you like or what you're good at, two very different things. And where the coffee is fit for human consumption, the one thing you shouldn't do is only do one thing for X years. Join, I don't know, one company and be in the same role. Because there's a statistically insignificant chance that that one role is everything you want in life. And a way bigger chance that you liked it, but now you want to try something different because you just spent multiple years doing it. Within consulting, you'll be doing five different things in one year, probably, which can cost you sleep and whatnot, but you're also learning so much faster and you're figuring out so much faster what things you do and don't like. And for me, it was like public sector, private sector, big teams, small teams, 
very technical role, very very business like role, working working Scrum, working Agile, um, doing the business analysis, having to explain to people why this model is not as as evil as I think. I was it was a very steep learning curve, but thanks to that, I was learning more. And that's why I like the consulting uh, sector so much. And I get to work with so much, so many different peoples every few months in different projects. And that's actually the main, most important reason why I'm still at Capgemini six years later, because I kept being able to do new things. And if you're unable to do new things in your current role, then you should consider switching to a different role or switching to a different company. And as soon as I stop learning over there, then I'll probably also switch. But I keep learning, so let's go. Do you recommend then for someone who is just starting in their career, do you recommend consulting? Because you're kind of touching on lots of different areas, different industries, different clients. And so you get to try many different things, basically. Like my company of Capgemini works in uh, roughly 50 countries. Um, we have in the Netherlands, at least most of the, the, the financial sector, uh, of the government sector, a lot of big retail organizations, all as our clients. And I, I got to do projects at, in all three of those sectors way faster than had I worked for one of them and then switched. Mm. So that is very much the added value. One one downside that I see is like, so I, I really like this part of trying different things, looking at different projects. But one thing is that you actually don't fully focus on a single product. So you will get an improvement, try to do it quite quickly within a couple of months, um, get a model, for example, ship it to the client, and then you move on to something else and you build a new model. So you're not really... I, I get that. I get that. But here is a spectrum because it's not black and white. Nothing is black and white. Everything yeah. is odd. Like the other end of the spectrum where you work multiple years on the same model, then you need to go to academics, basically. Um, or or you start your own company or you work for a startup. Because if you just directly work for mo for large organizations themselves, directly, not through a consulting firm, you also spend Okay, you spend more time on, on a single model than, than in my case, or m more multiple years on the same project, though I have spent multiple years in, in, uh, on the same project at Capgemini as well. But it is a spectrum of change, of, of depth versus width. And mm -hmm. there too, you can figure out what you like. Like the financial sector, for example, much more hectic, much more changing from, from week to month. Uh, whereas in the public sector, you can easily spend half a year tuning one model and, and it's fine. So uh, I'm, I'm saying yes, but there are there are much more dimensions to this mm -hmm. model than you might think. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, I've I've never worked in yes. in consulting. I'm I'm actually in a fintech startup, but I like this aspect of. So it's true that you're focusing on a single industry. I kind of miss the fact that. I want to look at what's happening in the well climate tech sector or computer vision field well whatever but you get to focus on a single sector you get to become an expert you get to really deploy a model when you deploy a model you need to think like two three years ahead because you know you're going to need to work again on this model Thank you get you to also improve it a lot so you start with a very basic model and then um, well, a few months or years ahead, you get to deploy it in production and now suddenly you can retrain your model automatically. And so all of this kind of excites me. But uh, I think as in every sector, or in everything in life, it's never black or white. There are always pros and cons, but wanted to get your, your view on this. I think the big question here is what's your preference and... The big answer is one you can only ever attain by trying both. Yeah, exactly. Like I, I am an expert at sitting on that couch and arguing <laughs> uh, why that's a be uh, why that's a better alternative than things I have never tried. But you only really have you only really have data to talk about once you've tried it. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely trying many things. That's why I think also internships is a great way 
um, try many things, do lots of internships. I just spent 10 minutes talking about how Tyra 5 for 5 and the police changed my life, and those were internships. So do you want to talk about how... Yeah. Yeah, okay. Six years ago, I started as a young professional at Capgemini, and I qu very quickly learned over there, especially in consulting, it's not about uh, just about what you do, but also about what you do besides what you do. Like, they will get you an assignment, a core a core task, a something you're doing for, for, for a client, for a role, for a team. Um which, which which I started doing. I started uh, um, learning, and I, I can't mention all of the names uh, of, of, the, of the clients uh, for obvious reasons. Um, but it's actually besides that, when you're in between projects, which we call when you're on the bench, so to say, um, that you also have capacity to work on your skills and uh, to, to work on um, different certifications, but also on internal projects. Um, and one of those projects, many years, uh, like four years ago by now, uh, me and some friends were in touch with, a st uh, with an NGO operative in Kenya back then, now mainly in India, um, who was helping smallholder farmers, giving them advice, like, like two hectares of land with what, what will your yield uh, be end of season? Uh, how much fertilizer do you need? That, that kind of stuff. But soil quality analysis based on some satellite footage. And um, I said to a bunch of colleagues back then, hey, you're in between projects. I'm in between projects. If we're going to build something to learn, we might as well build something that keep people can benefit off. That became Project Farm, one of my biggest uh, projects, um, where we built a data platform for that NGO for farmers in Kenya to, to help them with stuff. And now we're developing another uh, version for India. I was in India last uh, December because of it. Because um, we have the skills and if we're going to use them, we might as well use them for good. So this became a huge pro bono project for Capgemini at a global level by now uh, to build models to aid smallholder farmers because like 40, 50% of our world food supply does not come from super farms with tractors and drones but from small farmers with two hectares and a donkey. Mm -hmm. And if you want to increase our world food supply, we need to do it through that. And right now I'm, I'm mentoring students who are building the new models for, for what was it, crop vegetation uh, infection. So to use image recognition models to, to check out if there's bugs on your plant, what type of plant is it? Is it going to affect your... Uh, uh, is it going to affect your crop? What should, should you do? Should you send warning signs to all, all the other uh, farmers in the area? That kind of stuff, which is relatively simple in terms of technical, but can make a huge difference for farmers over there because they might not all have landlines, but lo and behold, everyone has a, has a cell phone nowadays. And they might not even all be able to write, uh, read or write. But if you use fancy icons, then the son will explain to the father what the app is saying about his crop. So, so did you, if I understand correctly, did you actually start this project as a side project, like on your own? Yes, that's, I was, I'm sorry, that, that was the main uh, thing. We started it out as a side project in between assignments, uh, but it's, val it's valid work experience. Um, just like your, your school projects are, and your internships are valid work experience. And um, there, there's the eternal, uh, uh, the et eternal struggle for people without work experience being rejected jobs where they can get work experience because they don't have work experience. This counts as work experience too. And suddenly they all had two, three months of work experience building a data platform for an NGO in Kenya. That adds up. And that... That made me evolve in my role at Capgemini, where I'm now part of the Applied Innovation Exchange, we call it, basically it's our innovation zone in the country, uh, in the company, uh, where I run three, four of these projects simultaneously now, mainly, um, mainly, for, mainly from an NGO uh, of not-for-profit perspective. Uh, because our company builds cool AI models for large financial and large retail organizations, and we can't tell anyone about it without getting sued, if you get what I mean. 
meaning we can't tell anyone about it and can prove to nobody about that we can do cool stuff. So most organiza- uh, consulting organizations, mine as well as our competitors, we need these types of projects to actually mm-hmm. talk about at events. And then they started asking me, hey, Marijn, can you go to this large event and talk about it? And I'm like panicking, like, yeah, but can you talk about AI? I think this was during my very first year. Yeah. Can you talk about AI? I'm like, what the fuck do I talk about AI? <laughs> well, you do machine learning, right? I'm like... I built like two machine learning models back then, first year. One of them worked. I'm like, cool, that means you're an expert. Okay, I'm an expert. So that weekend, I just looked at my at my book closet, which is like right around the corner over there. Mm-hmm. And I looked at all my sci-fi novels from, from back in the 80s and 90s. And I'm like, I'm just going to talk about my sci-fi novels. And I loved it. So that's when I started developing myself as a public speaker as well. This is something I also like to do. Um, as a side hustle, as a side project that escalated and became its own thing down the line. And now I'm speaking, uh, I'm a three-time speaker at the World Summit AI. And you're coming to speak on the AI Stories podcast, which is exactly. even better. Exactly, now I'm excited on podcasts. Oh my <laughs> God. Before we're all automated away by ChatGPT. Just my luck. Great timing. <laughs> so is... Basically, those projects, you're not directly making money from those projects, but you're using those projects because then you can talk about the nice technologies that you're developing and kind of sell your work to other clients. Is that right? Yes, there's always a short term and a long term game because in the short term, we are not directly profiting off this, but uh, I don't believe organizations should only be driven directly by profit. Um, we upskill and upgrade our own people with it, so they benefit, um, and they can actually tell their mom about this project, you know. Um, and we, um, when when we're in large bids and and such, because we're a large multinational, so it's mm-hmm. big contracting. Uh, then having references like these totally do work. So, yeah. farm has been used for large references in the agricultural sector, and then suddenly I'm like, oh yeah, this is great. Even though we didn't directly profit off it, in the long term, from a strategic perspective, we need this. Every company needs this. And um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm now running at a strategic level, really, because of that. Plus, you're making the world a better place. With data. With data, always. So, so, so what do you do exactly, just to give, can you give me like a few short examples of how you can help farmers. You mentioned this computer vision thing. Uh, what else do you do? And is the goal to essentially collect data from farmers, use it to drive insight, uh, and then... Same as with Google, because Google nowadays doesn't call it data science anymore. They call it decision science. And I think that is a good term. We ha- help improve their decision making. We're not going to uh, be the white guy who wa- comes over to to a, th- uh, to a developing nation saying, this is how you should farm. Cause, hell no, have you seen my plants? I can barely keep them alive. As <laughs> is. Uh, but we look at their decision making and try to improve that. So we partner with local NGOs who know the stuff, the decisions farmers make and the mistakes they make. And we basically automate part of their advice. So if they have three hectares of land, they should use this much fertilizer because more fer- it's not linear. More fertilizer doesn't mean more yield automatically. Um, so we calculate the optimal amount of fertilizer so they don't overinvest because it costs them like their savings. And they spent their entire savings buying fertilizer and dumping that onto the, onto the land. And that is a risk because that means they have no more savings. Um, which is a very relatively simple optimization model, but it makes a huge difference for them. Like one of the one of the functionalities we you that that were you was being used most was just the weather report, not because they can't access weather reports online, but because we specified it to their exact location rather than mm-hmm. weather report in this area, which is harder to look up because ease of use is also a, a big determinant here which is also why the real reason I think ChatGPT is the Google killer, not because it's better than Google, the answers are objectively worse, but because it's easier to use because you don't have to click two or three links. So people will flock to whatever is easier to use. Um, 
Um, so we were we were experimenting with some satellite footage to to uh, identify soil quality, identify the perimeter of their uh, of the plot size, for example, because I, I I believe this is a male farmer thing that they brag about their plot size. But if they say yeah, five hectares of land, really they have three hectares of land. But if they brag about five and we enter five into the yield prediction model, what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> So suddenly we're, we're compensating for compensation, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is a major mm -hmm. data quality issue. And, and that, that's, that, that's just fun. Those, those are some of the examples. Mm -hmm. And I run three, four projects like that. We're also doing another one of my, one, one, another of my babies called Project Enhance, which we do in collaboration with the World Food Program and uh, Johns Hopkins uh, University and Tilburg. So we're working with um, with sci actual scientists here um, who developed actual models to how to feed, feed the world better, diet optimization models that you can use to calculate how to feed as many people as possible as cheaply and as nutritiously as possible. You do that calculation a little bit better, means more people fed, which in, for example, times of uh, suddenly grain prices spiking worldwide, this is very relevant stuff. And it's the academics who develop and improve those models. And we help scale them to a cloud platform with, um, uh, with nice dashboards and such. So we don't actually optimize the model itself, but we do all the engineering and the visualization surrounding it. And I'm using it as a, uh, as simultaneously as a place to, to train, uh, to train my team. Um, and again, making the world a little bit better with data. It looks like this is kind of what you've been doing your entire life. Like we've talked about, we talked about Ebola. We talked about crime, not prediction, but crime analysis. I got it right. We talked about helping farmers where, with how they manage their crops. We talked about your last project on nutrition, how what drives you to do all those good things? How, yeah, you've been doing this your entire life. What, what drives you to do this? Ah, not my entire life. Just the last six to 10 years, depending on how, how you look at it. Um, as I said, I want to help people. I, God bless, that, that's, that's what, what I like doing in life, what gives me energy, what makes me come to places to talk about it. Um, um, and I, I've had so many people, mentors who helped me in my life when, when, when the chips were down, when stuff was tough. And uh, I believe it's beautiful to see people help each other out like that, be it emotionally, be, be it uh, economically, be it by help giving them advice or, or teaching. I teach a lot uh, at universities or on the other side of the world, like I, I taught class in Ghana during the uh, COVID pandemic. So that's two weeks in the most terrible Skype connection you can ever imagine, but you're teaching class, teaching them statistics. Or even as simple as sending sending drones to friends I have in Ukraine, like trying to f find the right type of drone and shipping it because they they need every drone they can get. It's it's literally saving lives. That That's helping people. And I want to do that. And I want to do that do using the stuff I'm good at, the skills I have. Well, apparently I'm good with data, I'm somewhat okay with coding and modeling and explaining what the hell is happening and running teams to do that. And apparently also talking about it on stages. So that's what I do. You have the things you can do and there's the things you want to do. And it's our goal in life to combine those two. And for me, that's using data to improve people's lives. And I think to the audience, especially when, when you're starting out in the data science uh, world or just in the data world as general, because I think both terms we use to describe it are soon outdated, is to try as many different things. Because otherwise, you're never going to figure out what you're actually good at and what you like to do. And where, you know, the coffee is okay. Financial sector has way better coffee, I'll give them that. Public sector has terrible coffee. But, like, 
doing analysis on how many people get stabbed is like the coolest thing I've ever done, I guess. And the coffee was absolutely the worst. <laughs> and the best coffee I ever had was definitely at, at, at those banks. But um, mortgage engages just don't do as much for me, you know? So using this sample size of two, I can totally say that the worse the coffee, the cooler the stuff. Mm -hmm. So take my advice on that. Um, and yeah, that's that's what I get to do. That's what I was doing with WikiLeaks in 17, uh, 18. That's uh, when we were using leaked Afghanistan data to prove where the war crimes were happening, where they weren't happening to speak truth to power to the American government. And now I'm doing the same thing with how, as we, as they call themselves brain damaged cartoon dogs online. Um, but now the war crimes are in HD as we're mapping what's happening in Ukraine using satellite images to track the size of, of the mass graves and, uh, and to check where the, where the Russian tanks are rolling and to, 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 to mine Tinder data to see where the Russian soldiers are at. So we're basically doing the Hague's work for them because that very same data a few years down the line will be used in the Hague to figure out those war crimes. Data as a field is only growing, only growing bigger. We used to say, yeah, you do something in IT, you do something with computers. One in three jobs in the labor market is something with computers and that's only going to expand. It's the only field in the a part of the labor market that is still growing and will continue to grow for the decades to come. So please, <laughs> people, learn to use at least the basics of data and statistics because it's not about having the most sophisticated in deepest deep learning model. It's ha having a model that works to solve a real problem for real people. And yes, I too am scared of the amount of Excel people use in this field very much, but I'll also admit um, that Excel is the most used data analytics tool in the world, <laughs> which technically Thanks. speaking, technically speaking, mm -hmm. um, but those are the kinds of people that you need to keep in mind that have the problems that you're trying to solve. And I can get lost in the depths of, of how we can solve it technically when often a more simple solution, and that's why I keep mentioning regression models, random forest models, let's go with XGBoost, let's do that, uh, to explain the problems. Like when I'm modeling burnouts, I haven't even talked about burnouts, um, or, or, or gender pay gaps, as just mentioned, or forecasting uh, beer sales, I need to explain why my model is making the prediction. Or when, when it's about people, uh, refugees crossing the borders, because only if I can explain why I have this prediction, can we anticipate it and can we potentially do something about it? And in our drive of the last half decade for privacy, GDPR, all that, I think we lost track of transparency and explainability. And now we mandate it legally, even though we just made it impossible to get the data on the gender, ethnicity, and sexual preference of everyone in my data set that I need to check how my model works mm -hmm. and how hard it's discriminating. Because again, we developed these models not to forecast, we mo developed these models to explain and to explain how hard people are discriminating, to measure it. And now we're complaining, what if the AI discriminates? And I'm like, it's damn well supposed to. So we can measure it. Because Machines are biased. Any AI is biased. Every algorithm is biased. There are, there are no unbiased algorithms, but there are no unbiased humans either. I've studied them. I have yet to encounter a single <laughs> one. And we need algorithms and data to prove the bias of humans as much as we need humans to prove the bias of AI. So I'll have a job for the next decade to come, and so will you, and it's been fun. Well, thanks. Lots of super insightful things there. I think the key takeaway is really try to understand why. Don't just try to build bigger models that work, because the bigger the models, the less explainable they, they are. And so 
you kind of think you understand them, you think you know what's going on, but they are like a hundred billion parameters. So how can you really explain well, they, why? They kill your darlings. Why are you mm -hmm. using a million uh, parameters? I, 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 need, I need to cut those. And again, it's not your job to build the biggest model, but to build the best model. And big, bigger isn't always better as much as I like to brag mm -hmm. about million parameters. So the whole small data trend will eventually become a thing. But for that, we need to go back to the roots of actual modeling and not just in uh, pip install some auto ml uh, stuff like h2o and let's go i built a model daddy <laughs> so yeah let's just finish the episode with one advice if you just had one advice for people to progress in their career just one what would it be i think i already said it three times but <laughs> dare to try new things dare to step out of your comfort zone dare dare to pick roles that you're not used to, dare to pick tasks that you're not used to. Uh, see, and if, even if you fail at them, that means you learn something and you're there in your career to learn because the moment you stop learning, you're dead. And that, so this includes daring to be the expert, daring to step out, daring to raise your voice, especially when ethical stuff is concerned because silence is compliance and silence is violence. That's something we learned over the past year. Just ask all, all of my friends in Ukraine and dare to not just be an NPC in the audience of your life. Well, thank you. What a great way to end the episode. Thanks a lot, Maureen. It was great to learn from you. Have a great evening in the Netherlands and yeah, hope to catch up soon. Cheers, everyone. Like and subscribe. <laughs>